Welcome to uh, a conversation dismantling racism ballet hosted by Ballet West. My name is Elizabeth Storter Pryor. I'm actually a historian at Smith College. Uh, I have a son who has been an academy student for the last couple of years and is now in college at Ballet West. And so that is my connection. And we are really lucky today to have a conversation with uh, true luminaries in classical ballet, little <laughs> teary, um, to talk about what it was like coming up um, when there were not role models in, in classical ballet for women of color. So um, I'm gonna start by uh, introducing um, everybody and I'm gonna start uh, with Lauren Anderson, um, Lauren is a native of Houston and joined the Houston Ballet in 1983. And in 1990, became Houston Ballet's first black principal ballerina and is currently in a new role with Houston uh, Ballet in their education and uh, community engagement program. Um, next, we have Deborah Austin. Uh, Deborah uh, was a dancer with the New York City Ballet and is still one of very few women of color who were with the New York City Ballet. She became a prominent dancer in the company and um, George Balanchine even created roles for her um, in that capacity. She was also with the Pennsylvania Ballet and the first principal ballerina of color in a predominantly white major American ballet company um, and was a leading dancer with the Zurich Ballet. We also have Evelyn Cisneros Legate, uh, who launched her career with the San Francisco Ballet and was the first Mexican American ballerina there. Um, she started her career under Lou Christensen and continued with uh, Helga Thomason. Um, and I am um, excited to announce that she is also the incoming director of the Ballet West Academy, which mm -hmm. uh, will be a position that will formally start November 2nd. So congratulations to Ballet Thank West. You. <laughs> and to you, <laughs> but to mostly to Ballet Thank West. You. Very exciting. Um, and, um, we also have with us Virginia Johnson, who was one of the founding members of um, Dance Theater of Harlem and the artistic director of Dance Theater of Harlem, um, and their prima ballerina for many years. Mm -hmm. um, she's also a founder um, of Point Magazine and served as the editor-in-chief there for 10 years. So these are as I said, incredibly luminous careers. Um, which says to me, as a person who studies race and racism um, in the United States, that those careers were probably accompanied with a lot of perseverance and, and grit to be able to get where you were in, in the field of classical ballet. And so I thought I'd start with a really simple question and maybe start with you, Evelyn. Um, can you say if you've ever experienced racism in ballet? Well, I think because it's initially a European art form um, that it kind of does bleed into the uh, workings of a ballet company. Um, but I also feel that it, um, that I felt personally I was able to rise above it and actually be able to bring other elements from my Hispanic heritage and ended up being um, actually more gifted in, in those respects on knowing the, the culture that I came from and being able to implement those uh, natural uh, feelings and emotions and into the, into the work. And then I was also very fortunate to be working under Michael Smune as co-artistic director with Lou Christensen in my early years. And he was very taken by the Hispanic culture. And so I felt in many respects it actually enhanced 
my opportunities at that time. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, Deb, tell me a little bit about your experience. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I experienced it even as a student at the School of American Ballet. You know, when I was 14, they told me I would never get into the New York City Ballet. So it just made me work harder and strive for more. And, um, I, I, you know, I didn't, it didn't make me quit. I mean, Dance Theater of Harlem hadn't even uh, started yet. So, you know, I really had nowhere else to where I would feel that I would, would go, you know, if, if I didn't dance in New York City Ballet. At that time, you know, there was San Francisco Ballet, there was maybe Boston, there, the, the, you know, the, the dimensions of companies were just nowhere near where they are today. So it was a pretty scary time for me. Um, you know, they told me that if the, the, the staff, you know, um, told me that I would, I would have to be a soloist. And then uh, years later, just recently, I was just told that they told Arthur Mitchell that. So, um, yeah, mm -hmm. so, and that was like 15, 20 years later. So, you know, but then when I was 16, Balanchine came, Mr. B came into class and he took me. So, so I, you know, I, it, I was thrilled beyond belief. I mean, I didn't think I was going to get in at all. They, I was young, so they tell two girls that, they took them into the company. And me, they told me to have my mother call them. So that really scared me after having been told you weren't going to get in. I thought Mr. B had watched class that day and that they were gonna come to me and say, I'm sorry, you know, you know, we, we don't want you, you know, it's over, you know, you're, and I was, I just turned 16, so I was devastated. But then, you know, then the good news, I called my mother, mom, and she, you know, she said, Debbie, Mr. Valentin has just taken you into the New York City Valley. I was like, what? <laughs> what? Oh, my God. I, like, ran and jumped on some <laughs> guy company members, like, <laughs> put my feet around his waist and just, like, hugged him. So it was a really exciting day. But, you know, you it's it's hard. You, you, did, you don't have... You didn't have really role models at that time. When I was growing up, there were no... You know, people ask me all the time, so who did you, what black dancer did you look up to? But I mean, even Raven Wilkinson was, she was dancing in 1955. That's when I was born. So, you know, it was, you know, there was not really too many dancers out there that you could sort of, and it's funny now I'm teaching through this virus and everything, I'm teaching uh, two students from the School of American Ballet, um, two black girls and of color, women of color, and they, you know, they reached out to me. So, and I just had a conversation with one of them because sometimes I teach them together. Sometimes I teach them privately. And she said to me, I'm so scared because she's 16 years old. She's a beautiful dancer, really beautiful. And she said, there's three of us in my class and we just don't think all of us are going to get in. And you think mm -hmm. in this day and age that you could still be saying there are three of us and maybe one of us will get in. I mean, that just breaks my heart, you know, and I've seen the School of American Ballet students and each and every one of them are really good dancers. I mean, I know it's hard to even choose. So you've got the diversity of, of the white dancers or, or, you know, Asian or Spanish or, and then you have the two, three black girls that are in the class and they're all striving for that same thing, you know, I can't even um, only imagine, you know, so. That's incredible. That sort of brings up a question that I'm going to ask in a second, which is how, I mean, it makes me wonder how to create community among other dancers when really there's this idea, especially when you are all coming up, that you, you might be one of, you know, like, you know, there, there's one spot and there's three girls. Like, how, did, how does that, how do you still kind of foster that community? But I'll turn... Um, the next question, uh, or the same question over to Lauren. And I will tell you that I was speaking earlier today to Adam's flute, and he said um, a really profound moment for him was when the Houston Ballet was touring in New York, and he saw you with not wearing pink tights up on stage, that you were wearing skin flesh tone tights and that to him he thought that was only, that was a dance theater of Harlem thing 
but that wasn't something he, he didn't imagine that outside of it and that that had this really pro profound impact on him thinking more broadly um, about even in white companies could adopt this kind of practice. So um, I was wondering if you wanted to speak to that or any part of your experience as a... Well, I, I will say that I remember precisely that tour because that was the first time that, um, it was shortly before that was the first time I ever put on brown tights. So all of a sudden I was liberated, right? I said, I will never wear pink mm -hmm. tights again. But I, I mean, I literally said that, right? Well, of course I did, but um, I'll never forget. And it was funny, I really wanted to go to New York too. And I really wanted to dance because I auditioned for SAB and they sent me two letters saying, don't come. Right, I think it may have been a computer glitch why I got the second letter, oh. but I, I really think, uh, um, well, no, not computer glitch, because it was a long time ago, they didn't have computers. But um, I, and I didn't even think I would actually get an SAB because you had to look a certain way. There was a certain look that, S that you had to have in a certain way you had to, and that wasn't me, especially at the time that I auditioned. But my um, SAB came to Houston Ballet, right, and had auditions in Houston. And everyone said, you need to audition for the um, experience of auditioning. Well, it was the scariest thing in my life. I was 13. I mean, I, I didn't even have a ballet body at that point. I didn't, I was like Conana on point, right? And, and so um, I hadn't lengthened. I hadn't, I was working horribly. Um, I hadn't been introduced to Pilates or uh, Grand Modern or any of that. So I didn't, um, I wasn't working correctly at that time. All that said, uh, the brown tights was a huge thing for me. Um, for some people, I know they were like, I will look so much better in brown tights. And it had nothing to do with, I will look so much better. It just made sense. And it, it was an extension of my line, right? <laughs> but I will say that I'll never forget the first time um, I saw a, a black ballerina on stage. I was nine years old and I was uh, at Jones Hall in Houston and my mother took me to see Dance Theater of Harlem. Now I didn't know I was going to Dance Theater of Harlem. I just went to the theater and um, I'll never forget. I didn't know I hadn't seen a black ballerina until I saw one. Like it didn't mm -hmm. register. To me. It's just I was in ballet class with everybody else. I knew I was the only little black girl in there but I just I mean it, I just I just didn't know I hadn't seen one and then I saw one and then I saw another one and I turned to my mom and I said, there's a whole stage full of them. And then that's when I was like, I want to do that and I want to be her. The girl in the middle in that red tutu is Firebird. I want to be her. I mean, that's kind of when that happened for me. I think I was very fortunate. And, and, and I always wonder how Debbie did it. Like, girl, how did you do it? Not seeing <laughs> yeah. you. Right, because what inspired me, because I was about to quit ballet, what inspired me at nine was seeing me on stage. That's the thing, that was like my driving force. Then after that, it was a straight up competition and you told me I can't, so I am, type of thing. And, and ballet just feels so good. It feels so good mm -hmm. to become music, right? I never thought I couldn't once I saw that, it, that there were people that were doing it. So I thought I would train in Houston and then go get a job in Dance Theater of Harlem. Now, Mr. Mitchell may not have ever even hired me, <laughs> but I just knew that that's how my life was going to go. That's what I thought was going to happen for me. So um, those brown tights meant a lot in so many different ways, right? In so many. And I did wear pink ones again because we did balancing ballets and we had to, and Vicki Simon was like, oh, no, no, you're wearing pink tights. <laughs> so. I mean, yeah. You know. That must have been hard, though, once you had sort it of was. a decision to go back. Like, in, it was, like you're, it, you're talking about kind of like you, you, you saw the light, like you're nine years old and you're like ballet dancers, and then you're like, oh. And then the same thing kind of with the tights, right? You put the tights on. And yeah, but let me tell you. So this is the thing. It, it, I had the opportunity to do the lead and theme and variations. You think a pair of brown tights were gonna keep me from doing the lead and theme and variations? Are you kidding me? No way. So I'm putting on some pink tights. <laughs> brown, pink, I don't care. Da, 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 da. I was like, I'm doing the lead and theme. 
You know, and I had the opportunity to be the lead in every balancing ballet we did. I was wearing pink tights. I was good with it. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> so, um, so Virginia, I'm kind of saving the conversation now for you because your experience must be so different than your colleagues in some ways, or maybe not, being from the Dance Theater of Harlem. I mean, do you, are these experience feel similar or, I mean, how did, how did that come to pass that you connected with Dance Theater of Harlem? Was it because you knew yourself to be a black dancer or is there something else that brought you to that company? Oh, that's a, that's a really complicated question. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I am a founding member. I, I came to Dance Theater of Harlem in 1968 and that's the, the year that Arthur Mitchell had actually started that summer. And, uh, uh, and I didn't even know there was a company here, um, but I was a, a, a dancer who had studied ballet my whole life and had, um, you know, seen, seen ballet in myself and seen myself in ballet and not seen any different. There was no separation. There was no reason why I shouldn't do this thing that I loved so much and <laughs> gave so much joy. But I had the experience as, as, as Debbie had had that, you know, the director said to me um, of my school, she said, well, you know, you're going to have a career, but you're never going to be a ballerina. Nobody's going to hire you. There are no black ballerinas. So, um, but you know, the funny thing was uh, she waited until the year I was graduating. She waited until that, that time when she was sending me out the door and have a career. But by the way, it's not going to be what you thought. <laughs> so I was grateful for that. Um, but I also knew that I was I, that ballet was who I was, and that I needed to be in this art form. That it was the thing that I that I loved most, most, most in the world. And so uh, I, when I got to New York, I was at NYU in the dance uh, department at NYU, and somebody said that Arthur Mitchell was teaching classes up in Harlem, and I should go up there and take my ballet class and get it over with, and come back downtown and do the real dancing. It was very much disdainful people about ballet, but it was who I was. And I, I came up and uh, yeah, Arthur Mitchell was starting a ballet company. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I, I told him I wanted to be part of it. And I really wanted this to be, this is what I had always dreamed of. And he was very skeptical. It's like, well, I don't know about, you. you're not ready to be my, one of my dancers and I'm not who. So he was testing, definitely testing. <laughs> Uh, and I was like, no, I have to be here. <laughs> and so I went through some rough times, but um, the, the really interesting thing though, Dr. Pryor, is that um, this, this was the, um, this is the 1960s, you know, Dance Theater of Harlem was, was uh, founded uh, after the assassination of Dr. King. And it was, a, it was a moment of black power and black pride and black, uh, the, the, the back to Africa sentiment, the whole issue about who are we as people in the world? And I started to look around at this art form that I loved so very much and wondered, well, I love it. I seem to be able to do it, but should I be doing ballet now? And it was really a very difficult moment because I, I started to question whether this thing that gave me so much joy was something that was appropriate for me to do. Um, and then I found Nancy to Farland. And I found all of those people who were in that first company, those first years, all of us had been told, no, you can't, you don't belong. You can't do this. And Arthur Mitchell was saying, we are going to show you what ballet can look like. We are going to change what you think ballet is. And so it was uh, a moment of militancy in America. And I was able to turn my little bun head into uh, an Afro of militancy and still be in ballet. And it was really very important to me that this thing that I thought I loved so much and I thought was so important could be relevant and real in the, in the world. Not an escape, not a fairy tale, not something about other people, but it could be about me too by being in it. And so those first years at Dance Theater of Harlem were important crusading years. And it, it really gave me a, a different understanding of what it was to be a ballerina and why it was to be a ballerina. And it's why I'm in this office at Dance Theater of Harlem now. It's like, you know, people need to understand that ballet is so much more than what you think it is. And this issue of who belongs and who doesn't belong 
is really not the story. It's what is it about? What is ballet for? And it's for everyone. So that's that whole thing kept me going for all those years. <clears throat> Beautiful. Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry. Bye -bye. <laughs> wow. So beautiful. I mean, I'm just struck. I mean, Deb, when you were talking, I was so struck and, and you kind of repeated the same sen sentiment, Virginia, but I'm sure you all came up against this, like, why keep going? Like, what was in there that kept you going against these no's? I mean, these are people who are in the field who are like, yeah, you're a good dancer. You're not going anywhere in this field. Mm -hmm. Like, you're done. This is, this is your, this is your, you know, t top. This is as far as it goes. Like, what kind of becomes the thing that kept you in? How did, I mean, and, and you proved right. Virginia, yeah, go ahead. So I, I just want to just level the playing field because everybody in ballet has that. Everybody in ballet gets told no, too. You know, mm -hmm. that you're not enough, that the passe is not high enough, that you're, you're not stretching your knee. I mean, it's, it's part of the culture to be, I don't think you can do this. So, of course, for all of us, it has an extra weight because you don't know whether you're not doing it well enough, executing it well enough, or whether it's because you're Black and, uh, mm -hmm. and executing it fine, or you're Black and you're not executing it well enough. So there's the, that stuff gets in there a little bit. But, you know, ballet dancers are the strongest people in the world because you are constantly working against this opposition to being right. I just wanted to throw that in because I think that you, your question is also very pertinent to all of us, but, but it's not like we're the only ones that get said no to. Right. Right. Like basically most ballet dancers aren't going to make it. Like, I mean, most people <laughs> in, my, in my, my class, actually, he took the three of us and told the whole rest of the class he didn't want them. So that was pretty harsh as well on them. And, Suki at the time, she told three of the girls, don't leave the school um, because they're doing the Stravinsky Festival in the spring and stay at least until then. And then he wound up taking two of those girls out of that class. So, yeah, so that was not easy on them either. You know, it's, it's, Virginia's absolutely right. But we do have a little bit of the weight on the shoulder because is it because my passe wasn't high enough. I didn't jump as high as that one. You know, you, you have doubts in your mind because you're not quite sure if it's this or if it's that, you know? So you always have. There's also that thing of what, which I got, um, especially when I started doing Sleeping Beauty, Swan Lakes, or Feeds and all that. Well, the only reason you're doing it is because you're wrong, right? So then there's that happening in the dressing room while I don't know, and, you know, and, and, of course, that's all you need to do is tell me, tell me something like that. I'm sharpening my point shoes and I'm digging in, I'm digging in my heels and I'm <laughs> going to show you, you know, that, that that's not going to be, like Deb said, that's not going to be the thing to get me yeah. done. Yeah. I get my, people, the monkeys People always like to do that way in the other direction. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, but it was a little bit of both. You know, when you're, when you're growing up and you're coming up and you're in there and you know that there's only one spot and there's 16 girls. Yeah. So you're like, well, okay, I got that against me and that against me. Uh, I'm going to dance as hard as I can. But then it's the, mir the miracle happens and you get in. <laughs> right. Yeah. I sorry, just want to... I, I didn't want to cut you off. Sorry, honey. No, I just wanted to jump in too and, and just say that I believe that um, all the ladies here, we all had like a, a passion in our heart that we had to do it. I mean, it was so much of who we are as, as young women. And um, I think Virginia, I had the same experiences, not thinking that I was different than everyone else, but then, you know, having a ballet master say, well, I'm sorry, you have to go up and powder your skin because you don't look like everyone else, you know? And that just as Lauren was saying, empowers you with not wanting to be like everyone else and to not be afraid to work harder so that you will achieve that highest goal, you know, and work so hard that nobody could ever say that 
you got anything easily because they could see your work ethic and that you were working for it and, and actually deserved it when things did go your way. So I think in a lot of ways it, it you know, we were strong and wanted it so badly because it was what we were created to do. Yes. Evelyn, forgive me my ignorance, but I, I know that there is sort of this um, kind of kind of subversive movement in ballet by black dancers, da Dance Theater of Harlem, and in some ways Alvin Ailey, you know, mm -hmm. is part of that story. But I don't know the story about Latinx ballet dancers and what that, you know, as a Mexican-American dancer, did you, it, was there like kind of like a culture of protest among other Latinx dancers? Like there was like a Dance Theater of Harlem or, some kind of community or is this something you kind of had to sort of push through by yourself and rely on you know your community outside of the ballet world? Um, that's an excellent question. When I started with San Francisco Ballet I was the only dark-skinned person in the company. Um, we had other Philippine dancers who were very fair and so it did become kind of a, a, a club of sorts that we would encourage one another and be encouraged by each other and work through those um, closed-minded ballet masters, mistresses that we had that felt it should only be, you know, one way and um, find your place within that. But I think that as dancers don't see each other, just like I really didn't see myself as being different as everybody else because we were all doing the same thing. We're all wanting to achieve the same technical goals and merits. Um, so you do, you are a sense of community simply because you're all working toward the same goals. And a ballet company is very much a team effort. You know, even if you're doing Odette deal, you're only as good as the core is behind you. You know, you can be doing an extraordinary job, but it's not as good as when everyone is in it together. So um, I was able to find that sense of community, even though there are very few Hispanics when I was first starting out in the companies. And now it's wonderful to look around and see so much diversity. It's just beautiful. Is there a tradition among um, Latinx dancers changing the, I mean, is this something you do um, as a brown woman, but not as an African-American woman, do you wear pink or do you do, <laughs> I mean, it, it, do you do a brown tight as well? Is that something? How, how That's a wonderful that question because um, my first experience really seeing somebody um, like Virginia, when we both were, went to Cuba, two different times together. And we were there dancing in Havana and Alicia was there and everything. And, and Virginia was wearing, you know, the, the tan tights. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm actually darker than her. But she <laughs> wears the tan tights and I wear the pink because simply of where we were and, you know, the tradition of the company. And I never felt offended that I was wearing pink tights. And I never even really thought about it until I'd seen someone else that wasn't, you know? And I thought, well, that makes sense. Um, so, I don't know, perhaps it's, it's when I grew up, you know, through the ballet that it, I wasn't offended by it. I, I wasn't, you know, I thought it was very cool that others were doing it, but, you know, our, our skins were very, very similar, so. Yeah, I, I, I never wore uh, beige tights or, or dark tights ever because I, most of my career, I was in New York City Ballet, there, I don't think I could have done that. Right. And even in Pennsylvania Ballet, you know, I mean, you know, we just, I never thought about it because I, I knew of Dance Theater of Harlem, of course, you know, and I've seen Dance Theater of Harlem perform many times, but just never thought to, to do that. Um, it was just never a thought for me. Um, so, I mean, I think it's beautiful, but I, just for me, I just never thought about it. It was so many years ago. I mean, we're going back 30 something years. So, you know, it's just, there wasn't that many, there were no dancers outside of Dance There of Harlem who wore brown tights that I saw. So, um, so for me, I didn't think about it, you know. The interesting thing is that the girls, I, I, it's funny that you asked Evelyn that because yes, at the Houston Ballet, I mean, there were white girls tea dyeing their tights because the pink had faded. So they were tea. So since the pink faded, they had to dye their tights. So they used tea and tangerine red. 
those two colors together to make a more flesh color because nobody's mm -hmm. pink. I don't care. Nobody's pink. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and it looks so good. So we were doing Pier Ghent. So what Adam saw was we were doing Pier Ghent in New York and I was the green lady. But the unitard on the white girls went from green to their flesh. So I put that unitard on and Ben was like, well, that looks ridiculous. That's not, you're not this, the green lady. You're this green and beige lady. It's weird. <laughs> so they dyed another leotard, another costume that had green feet that went up to brown legs. And, and that's where the whole thing started. Well, then we, were doing, we came back home and we were doing Sleeping Beauty or something, and I was a lilac fairy, and Ben looked at me and he went, I said, well, Ben, can I wear brown tights for lilac fairy? And he went, well, of course. And he goes, well, so then he talked to wardrobe and he, they didn't know what to do. And he said in rehearsal, someone call Dan Steele of Harlem and tell him get the, that color. <laughs> It was awesome. It was awesome. <laughs> and that's how that happened. It was 1986 or something. That's wow. when that happened. I'll mm -hmm. never forget. Yeah. But, but the brown tie, I'll tell you, the best thing in the world is doing a sugar plum fairy and looking like chocolate. Mm -hmm. like looking mm -hmm. like chocolate all the way down. Mm -hmm. I, I was a pop out. It, and it, but then, you know, your company has to invest because then they have to like right? They have to light it properly yeah. or it looks like right. I got purple tights on or something, right? So you got to take the pink out or the yellow out or the green out or whatever it is. And then, you know, so, so then when I would guest perform, I would call Christina and go, Christina, what's that gel going to do down there? Great. And so I could tell the lighting people because they didn't know how to light me because everybody else was, you know, I mean, this brings in a question that um, I was actually speaking with Adam about earlier, which is that, you know, we're not just, when, we, when we're talking about race and racism and dismantling it in ballet, we're not just talking about bringing in dancers, right? That's like, that's part of the story, certainly, but you're talking about bringing in lighting people or bringing in hair and makeup, or bringing in, mm -hmm. I mean, th th these are bringing in directors, bringing in choreographers, bringing in people, you know, like costumers, like different, you know, so there's really, like, it's really interesting to hear that story. I hadn't even ever thought about that, but like, um, I, you know, the, you know, I, I can't tell you how many school pictures I'm in at my all white Los Angeles private school, where I'm like, <laughs> you know, like, it's like all the girls and then my face is like reflecting, you know, the light bulb <laughs> in the picture because no, you know, nobody thought that it mattered how to, to light me, you know, so those kinds of questions mm -hmm. are really interesting. Um, yeah, um, so what, if, if you think about it, sometimes I'm stunned when you say things like 1986, I'm like, that seems so late in the civil rights story for that to be a moment of firsts, but we know that we're still kind of doing moments of firsts even now, which is really stunning. Um, but what do you think some of the maybe difference or differences or opportunities for young dancers uh, whether in Dance Theater of Harlem or other black companies or in predominantly white companies? Like, are there, are there more options or do you think that young dancers, you know, from your point of view are still struggling with these same kinds of questions of, uh, of, of how, it, is it race or is it my passe, basically? It, it, are, they, are they asking themselves these same questions? Are there more opportunities? What do you all think about that? Well, I have a La Sophie story to tell. I uh, was, was, our director wanted me to dance the role of the sylph. And um, the person who came to coach in and said it, um, said, I've never, I don't think she'd be good in, good for it because she's, uh, I just don't see her dancing this role. And, and the director said, well, why not? And he said, quite frankly, I've never seen a black sylph before. And the director said, have you ever seen a silk before? 
I want I dance the role of the silk. <laughs> you were still I've this, seen this, videos. This was the right director, Deborah, who Yes, yes, yes. I so, I never danced under a black director. <laughs> <laughs> there are so few of them still. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and Deborah. And what I'm finding fascinating it? is is that all of us, that's how we had so much passion in us at such a young age and achieved what we did, because look at us, we're still here. <laughs> we're still going strong. When we're still that? involved in this art form to keep it, keep it going and keep it moving and moving and moving and moving. So, yeah. yeah so Deborah, when great. was that? When did you do the still the first time? Um, I think it was probably, I guess it was 86, something like that. 86, 87. Okay, well, this, I don't know, it's just every decade, I swear to you. So in 96, I do the sylph in the exact same thing. The exact same thing. And, <laughs> and the thing is, I was doing it with Carlos Acosta. Well, I was supposed to, but I didn't. And, but we were on, on the front of the playbill, we're in the pictures, they've been taken, and Ben said, why can't she? They said, well, because she's not Celtic. <laughs> she, wouldn't under, she wouldn't understand it. What did you just say? I didn't hear that. Well, it, you know, because I'm not European. I didn't come from a Europe. So, uh, you know, um, it was interesting. So Ben said, well, just let's have her do it fourth cap. She, she's going to do it. <laughs> but it can be the last show and the last day or whatever. And of course I did it. And then they went away and I did it again. But I mean, but he said, he said that. And he said, well, and then of course Ben said, well, but Carlos is Cuban. He's black Cuban. Afro-Cuban is what he said. He's Afro-Cuban. He goes, oh, yeah, but he's James. It's okay. Okay for the guy. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it's not okay for the, yeah. So well, I mean, it was interesting. I, in some ways, what you're talking about is some, some intersectionality. Like, as Black women and women of color, there might be even more kind of obstacles in people's imagination about what you can be on the stage right there you know and i mean this goes back to what i study certainly which is you know ideas of what you know black women and beauty and you know what you know constitutes you know that's that goes way back that that has its historical roots in slavery and um and whatnot that's that's fascinating and you know virginia when i'm i'm wondering that being as your career was really centered in, in, it is really centered in Dance Theater of Harlem. How does it, it I mean, are, are there issues of race and racism that came up there even ever so subtly, colorism and, I mean, or, or are these kind of issues that don't happen at Dance Theater of Harlem? Uh, you know, I think that um, certainly racism and colorism, I think that they're part of the human condition. I think that we're always judging each other and, and um, wanting to be the person who's got everything. And if you haven't, then I think that's part of human nature. Um, there, were, there were times at, at Dance Theatre of Harlem where people were, were very much about colorism. You know, I'm certainly very fair skinned. And so people would say to me, well, that's, that's why you got the part. Um, we were a very wonderful, close company, a very supportive company. Um, we actually had little families where we adopted each other and took care of each other. So, that, so it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of um, backbiting. But in the end, you have five performances and who gets to dance them? And who didn't get to dance them? They've got to figure out a reason why. You know, Is it because my skin is dark? Is it because my passe was not high enough? Is it because the director really just doesn't believe in me? You know, these things are always part of our, our condition. Um, you know, I was incredibly, I still can't get over it. I stumbled into this place at the right moment and had the most amazing, amazing career. Um, I don't think I would have had a career if there had been no Dance Theater of Harlem. And I certainly did guest with other companies around the world and had, um, wonderful experiences, but I wasn't given, I wouldn't have been given the chance to develop into an artist in any other place. <laughs> and, and that's the thing that I think is most powerful about Dance Theatre of Harlem, because it, it did create an environment where you were pushed 
forward and back. And there was plenty of pushing back. No, you're not right. No, this isn't it. No, this isn't. But it, it, that's a strength that you get and you keep pursuing and working on those things that are in your way. I think that if I'd been given the chance to be in another company, that I might've been just the one exception. I mean, Lauren has had an amazing career, you know, because she was able to do so many of the principal roles. So many black dancers come into a company as a token and get to be at a certain level and get to not necessarily be fully formed or, or given the chance to develop through the rough stages until they are the beautiful flower. I, th I feel that there are a lot of dancers whose careers have been cut short because of, of the skin color. I, I think that definitely has existed very much in the past. And I think it still exists today that you see a dancer and you go, so talented, but she's not right for that part. You know, instead of being in an environment where you get a chance to throw yourself into it and prove yourself or not. Companies are so large. There are so yeah. many people who want that opportunity. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to, to um, go from being a student to a member of the corps, to being a soloist, to being a ballerina. There are many doors that you have to pass through and so many of them are still closed. Are there, are there ways to open them? I mean, are there conversations? Because some of the things that you're saying about, I mean, just to keep going to our oft repeated, you know, kind of metaphor of the passe being high enough, which incidentally, I have no idea what that means, but I, I know, <laughs> so I just, just to be honest, but, um, but going back to this, this metaphor, like, Is there, is there a way in which if, if conversations were really happening about even, you know, the directors, the artistic directors own race and racism and the teachers own race and racism and the person who gets to say, you know, I want Balanchine to look at you, you know, I want Mr. Balanchine, you know, like, I mean, are there, are, are these people it, it, some way to get them to reckon with their own stuff so that the, even the possibility of opening up these doors. So I, think, I think directors are really important, you know, that, they, that they're open-minded, like Robert Weiss, who said that, I've, have you ever seen a sylph before? Because he always gave me every opportunity to dance everything. I mean, I was Swan Hilda with a blonde fronds. I was <laughs> Swan Queen. I was, you know, I danced a lot of the classical roles, um, Giselle, um, you know, so I think that it's important that directors see past your, the color of your skin. Like he said, have you ever seen a black silk before? Like, how can you even say that? And I don't think they meant, he meant the person didn't see it in a, but it, it's how you perceive things. It's like, wait a minute, that, that just never happened before. So, you know, um, you know, you need people to, the, the directors of companies to have open minds and to see people as good dancers and not just what color they are or mm -hmm. what it is. It's really important that it obviously always stems from the top, you know? Yeah. So when directors can see past the fact that you're, you're black or your skin is too dark or you're too this, and they can't see past that, that you can dance the classical roles because of that. I mean, it's just, that's really terrible. And there's probably a lot of directors out there that feel that way. So it's really important to be in a company where your director does not feel that way, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think of Harry Potter where, um, you know, the, the book and the films where people can imagine that uh, children fly around on broomsticks, but they can't imagine that, you know, Harry could fall in love with a black woman or that his best friend would, you know, like, so like, like th that would never happen. Well, people don't fly on broomsticks either, but they, but they, see, <laughs> but there's like, a certain, there's a certain, kind of like way in which people are willing to suspend their disbelief in in the artistic world mm -hmm. in certain ways that they seem you know not able to do that um i know like lauren and evelyn you're both in and maybe you all are in in positions as um 
teachers, you know, as at, at running, at running, you know, programs for, for kids. And do you ever come up against this yourself? Like, do you ever have to call yourself out as a director? Like I'm, I'm, when I say, look, I'm saying this thing that they're teaching me, or are you kind of trying to challenge the look when you're, when you're bringing young dancers up the kind of pipe? Like how does, how does that kind of work? for you. Go ahead, Lauren. Sorry, I had barking dogs, so I, had, I was on mute. Um, well, you know, I am in an awesome position because I am the program manager of education and community engagement. So I go into communities where everybody's dark, whether they're Hispanic or whether they're black, right? So, um, so I have a good. I get to bring the fabric of the community into the Academy of Houston Ballet and give scholarships. I, we are now working as in the Academy. I'm working with them on getting tights that reflect skin tone. Whether that tone, I said, now look, right? Everybody's not brown. I mean, everybody is everything from lily, lily white to really, really black. So mm -hmm. we, when you're going to enter this, be ready for people to not want to wear brown tights if they're brown or if they're white to want to wear brown tights. So you have, we have to work on language that's um, in being ex inclusive that doesn't exclude, right? Because that's like the new thing is diversity, equity, and inclusion. But there's also access, right? So you have to have access. That piece is what's really important to me. Right, everyone that goes into a ballet studio is not going to be a ballet dancer, but everyone has should have that chance to have high quality dance education. Period. <laughs> right now, I have a thing about uniform. Just make a decision, but whatever that decision is, be ready for pushback. Right, especially when you talk about introducing something new into the space. I think it's awesome. I'm so excited. I sit on the floor with matching shoes and tights so we can give direction. So we can say, you don't put mocha tights with light suntan shoes. We're not doing that. We're trying to be skin reflective and continuous line. That is the goal. So once we know what the end goal is, it's easy to reach and everyone's on the same page. So it's, I'm lucky. I'm not a director. I don't want to be the person I don't want to be the director. I'm not that material. I'm the second in command that says no to the director, right? No, you can't do that. Think about this. Like I, that's my role. I'm much better as the ballet mistress, not the choreographer. But um, so I'm, I'm lucky. I have it easy. I, I feel that directors are having a difficult time right now, mm -hmm. a lot of them, because of what is being asked and what is being asked. We're in this generation, so we want it now. Right? Well, this ain't gonna happen right now. This thing that we want now, it's, it's just not now. <laughs> it can't happen that way. It's like ballet. It takes time to learn. It takes time to change bad habits. If you have a chicken in your arm, it takes a while to keep it going yeah, right. before it gets there. And then it's there, right? Where it becomes habits. So we've got to just change some habits, which means we've got to change some thinking and be ready for all of the bumps and lumps that come with that. Go, go ahead, Virginia, you were. Oh, yeah, you know, I, I'm, I just think that it, the, the fact that we are finally realizing that it's systemic, that it's, it's, it's part of what America is to define race the way that it has. And it's, it's in a way that people are not even aware of how they're thinking and making those separations um, not, uh, they think it's natural to say that black people are like this and white people are like that. But that's, that's conditioned learning. And that's something that until we absolutely come to the point where you hear yourself saying something that is inherently racist and you think is inherently the truth that you have lived, we can't change it. Um, the only thing that we can do now is raise awareness and make sure that we point out when these things are happening that this that's a racist statement, yeah. that's a racist action. And I think when you say those words to people, 
they're instantly offended. And so that's a little bit defeating of the, 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 the task, but it's a first step. And then you have to say why it's racist and what to, to make that awareness of what that sentence, what that concept, what that idea, what that placement of the individual in your mind, where it comes from, that that's the only way it's gonna change. Because until you can see that you're seeing someone who is just like you as different, you're not gonna be able to accept them as just like you. So that wall is always gonna be there. It's, it's going to take time and it's not going to be an easy thing because I have good friends who say racist things to me, <laughs> you know, and it's not that they, they're my good friends and they don't realize what mm -hmm. they're saying. Mm -hmm. They're trying to be good friends. And I can't say, well, wow, you just really reduced me to <laughs> an object by saying that. It's, it's a, but awareness, awareness is the first step. Yeah. What do you, what do you think? Um, well, I've been, I've been teaching, I've been out teaching and um, actually worked with NDI in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which was primarily an outreach organization. And then, you know, I taught the whole and directed the whole after school programming. And that was something that was so wonderful for me to come in as a Hispanic woman and teach 80% Hispanic students. You know, but um, it also made it so real to me of going into a studio and seeing them all the same, you know, all these children that had this passion to try and be a dancer. And then now we're into we're integrating real ballet and real jazz and modern dance into their training and just trying to empower them as all being equal, as all being passionate about the same thing and and being able to attain that, you know, and, and I was there for uh, six years and now I'm seeing those students that I had started working and in, introducing ballet to them and they're all out in the pre-professional ballet schools now, you know, trying to, to find their own way and finding that passion, which they had no idea was even possible. It wasn't a possibility to them until you show them that possibility and then try to, um, open their eyes and then give them the technique and the passion to, to go forward that way. So um, I have had a bit of opportunity to start that with students already. And, you know, it's, it's wonderful. And it does make me reflect back on when I was a student and the only picture that I could find of anybody of any color other than white in the ballet world was Maria Talchief, you know, and I had that picture of her in, in the Firebird, and I would just put it up on my wall and, you know, and, and have something to try to attain. And now our students have so many role models that have, you know, branched out and, and been trailblazers so that these children can actually have someone to try and and rise up to well um, i am you know speaking of trailblazers we have with us here four trailblazers and just i feel like just kind of getting to the tip of the iceberg of your impact on the field and classical ballet and um, the kinds of role models that you serve for so many dancers who came up behind you. Um, and, you know, obviously thank, not to sound condescending, but thank you for that incredible work. We're, we are out of time, but I, um, that went so fast. Um, I could really do another hour, but I want to thank you so much. Um, Thank you so much for um, your honest and um, really deep reflections in this conversation. And um, I wanna thank Ballet West too for hosting this because mm -hmm. what I get the idea from hearing all of you is that these are just kinds of conversations that people don't have to listen to, don't have to perk up their ears to, to know, you know that somebody was told you can't do this role because there aren't Celtic you know, black people, which I guarantee is not true. I guarantee that's not true, <laughs> by the way. Um, but um, but uh, um, I just want to thank you all for your time and for your generosity in telling 
the stories of your careers here today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Pine. Thank you. Debbie Austin, that is a fabulous story. I'm sorry. Have you ever seen a sylph? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs>